Good morning. Welcome back, everyone. Y'all look happy, ready to learn today. Yes? Yes? Okay, okay. Um, if I didn't get to meet you yesterday, my name is Lizzie Shake Snyder. I'm the professional development manager for the auditor's office. It's great to be here with you today. I have the privilege of introducing our first instructor of the day, whom I've worked with for many years, Mr. Greg Kulpinski. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's been with the auditor's office for more than 23 years and currently serves as senior manager in the investigative audit services section. As manager, Greg is responsible for supervising and performing investigative audits of state and local government agencies and quasi-public entities. Greg has a degree in accounting from Southeastern Louisiana University and is a certified public accountant and certified fraud examiner. Please welcome Mr. Greg Kaplinski. Thank you. Um, like I said, again, now that the boss is gone, maybe we can have a little fun and talk about fraud. Uh, <laughs> he's still here, Greg. <laughs> oh, he's still here. Oh, my gosh. Because next I was going to talk about how, how he said, oh, the, we're, not, we're not doing I gotchas, and then he, he goes right into investigative. So, um, but, but trust me that nothing has ever gone out in an audit report that the agency didn't know about anyway before it went out. So um, the, the days of I gotcha are pretty much gone. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, for me, the thing that I notice here is I've got 23 plus years. I'm kind of on that downward trend towards retirement, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. But I know there's a, a, a lot of good work that, that's going to be done in the next you know, several years while I'm still here, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. Um, kind of the, the topics we're going to go over is the, the mission and role of LOA and IAS. You've, you've probably been inundated with the mission and role of the Louisiana Legislative Auditor, so we'll go through that quickly. But there's a couple things in the state audit law that I kind of want to point out to make sure everybody knows about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fraud triangle and some different fraud models. Uh, we'll examine the fraud tree from the uh, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. We'll kind of look at that. It's it's basically shows all the schemes, but it's it's centered around all occupational fraud and abuse. Um, so kind of we'll look at it in terms of the differences between for-profit entities and what we see in government. So. You'll, you'll notice there's kind of some differences there. Um, once we do that, then we can maybe get into some cases and talk a little bit about how the investigations into these schemes unfold. Uh, one of the things that I noticed, or one of the kind of thinking back, is one of the things that I was able to think about in looking at a lot of the, the, the work that we've done is in terms of the investigations, they, they tend to unfold in a manner similar to the five stages of grief. So it sounds a little morbid, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a good comparison, and you'll, you'll get a good idea of how these investigations go from start to finish. So we'll, we'll go ahead. And, and then at the end, um, in your slides, I put in some resources, some common control deficiencies that we come across, recommendations for some of the major fraud schemes that we see, and uh, some, some places to go to look to look for information on public funds. Uh, I'm sure you're inundated with that this week as well, so um, I probably won't get into that, but uh, it's there if you need it. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information on our website in terms of public funds, uh, FAQs, all that kind of stuff, so it's available if you need it. Uh, okay, legislative audit again, you're, you're being inundated with that. Obviously, we're going to focus on investigative services today. Um, basically, we, we gather evidence regarding fraudulent activity. Uh, state, local, and quasi-public entities. One of the other functions that we perform is uh, background investigations on employees, <coughs> excuse me, appointees to the uh, lottery board and gaming commission and you know in other instances uh, legislators want to know information they they have something specific that they want us to look at we'll look at that as well um, but the majority of our work is complaint driven uh, we, we start with the complaint and we kind of go from there uh, so here is basically real quick our authority to conduct investigations it's in the state audit law uh, the, the first one is basically non-compliance with audit law, an agency that has, hasn't complied. Uh, the, the second 
is, you know, an agency with a history of control deficiencies or non-compliance with laws and regulations. The third is the, the main one, complaints. We get complaints. Uh, probably a third of my job is dealing with complaints that come in. What are we going to do with them? And we'll get into that in a little bit. And then the fourth is whether <clears throat> there's an issue that the legislative auditor or the legislative audit advisory committee, if they want something looked at, well, it's within their purview to ask us to go ahead and look at it. So any questions on that? Any questions on complaints? Um, notification requirements, something, something a lot of agencies are not aware of that's in the state audit law. Basically, if, if the agency head has a uh, actual knowledge or reasonable cause to believe that a misappropriation of public funds has occurred, they are required to notify the legislative auditor and the district attorney in writing. So that is statutorily required. Uh, getting, moving on to complaints, uh, we have a fraud hotline. One of the things, if, if, you, if you review any ACFE information, um, one of the things that jumps out when, when talking about fraud is that 42% of fraud cases are uncovered through tips. So maybe eight, seven or eight years ago, we started a hotline. Prior to that, it was just people would call our office, they would call, we'd get the same people calling over and over again, and we didn't really have a good way of documenting and uh, kind of triaging those complaints. Uh, Roger Harris, the current director of investigative audit, he came up with a hotline um, and basically the statutory language to add to the audit law to say, hey, we have this, we have a hotline, we have a notice, the notice has to be placed in your agency and it has to be placed on your website so that people can go on your website and report fraud to the legislative auditor. And this is kind of the, I'm sure some of you have seen the the flyer on the right, on the left is from our website. So basically you can go on our website, you can fill out the form, or you, you have the number to call, you can fax whatever you want, and you can, you can mail us anything you want as well. When you fill out the form online, you can attach documents. Um, you know, when we take complaints, we're trying to get as much specific information as we can so that we can make better decisions as to where we're going to put our resources. Um, so like I said, dealing with the fraud hotline, probably I spend one and a half, two hours a day dealing with that. Basically everything that comes in uh, goes to one of the investigative managers, which is myself and, and another gentleman, Kevin Kelly. Um, those are routed to us. We review them. Uh, we probably do some background information, and if it's something that, that we think will have some financial impact or impact on that particular agency, then we'll probably put it on our list and get to it when we can. Um, otherwise, a lot of, if, if a complaint deals mainly with internal control issues, then we'll probably route that to the CPA who, who does the annual audit for that agency. Um, we get a lot of, you know, people call in or send in fraud reports on food stamp fraud. Well, DCFS, the state agency, they handle food stamp fraud, so we'll, we'll route that to them. Um, so I guess basically every, every complaint that we get, something is done with it, whether or not we uh, conduct an investigation, the CPA looks at it as part of their annual audit, or it goes to, uh, you know, the proper state agency with oversight over that particular issue. A any question on, questions on the fraud hotline? Okay. All right. Uh, basically, state audit law, we, we have access to, when we come into your agency, we have access to your records. Uh, and, and basically, in this particular statute, I'm, one of the things that comes up when we go into an agency is, well, this information is confidential. This is personnel information. This is HIPAA information. Well, this, the state audit law allows us to obtain that information, but under this requirement, we have to keep it as confidential as you do. So, uh, you know, many years ago when we would get information, uh, this is going back to the 90s, the late 90s and the early 2000s, 
we would make copies of information, put it in binders, and then we'd trek that stuff around when we talked to people and put documents in front of them. And that was hard to deal with. Now, now everything's electronic. Uh, everything is very secure. So when we do come in, if we do come into your agency and we take confidential information, we have a statutory uh, requirement to keep it confidential and it will not be shared with others. So um, that might put some folks at ease. Okay. So let's, let's get in. Any questions on any of that? Any, anything that Investigative does? Any questions you have? If we come into your agency, uh, complaints? Okay. Check time. Okay. So the fraud triangle, and I've, I've talked about this in, in, in uh, presentations before. I've kind of just scratched the surface. Um, and, and basically, this is Donald Cressy's. Uh, model of fraud, if these three elements exist, people are likely to commit fraud. And there's kind of a, there's kind of a 10, 80, 10 uh, model that says you have 10% of people over here will not, will not commit fraud under any circumstances. And then you got 10% over here on the other side of the spectrum that will commit fraud no matter what. That's just what they like to do. Um, but you got 80% in the middle and they may or may not commit fraud. But when these three elements are present, then there's a likelihood that they will. Um, so when we talk about pressure, the first, first leg of the triangle is pressure. Um, ACFE will say living beyond means is the, the main red flag, behavioral uh, red flag for fraud. Then they list out financial difficulties, divorce, addiction, they kind of go through a whole laundry list of different things. Um, but when I look at this, I, I see that it, th those are kind of vague. And if, I, and if we wanted to, we could say, well, living behind your means causes financial difficulties. Divorce may cause financial difficulties. Addiction may cause financial difficulties. So you, you basically have arrows going all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, and speaking of addiction, one of the things that we always see is gambling. But then the other thing that comes up, and this was something that's in the news, anybody follow the Alex Murdoch trial? I, I gotta tell you, I, Lizzie did. You know, as, as these events were unfolding over the last several years, I, I kind of, you know, you see them in your news feed. Um, but when the trial was going on and I think I was home on a Sunday night and there wasn't much on TV and CNN had a three-part series on the Murdoch family and, and basically where it goes to it's, it's basically death, destruction, murder, uh, embezzlement, you know, fraud, all kinds of different things and you know it gets to the point where supposedly Alex Murdoch was stealing from all of his clients, embezzling from the clients to support an opioid addiction. So I thought that was, uh, you know, I don't, outside of work, I don't read much, but if they, if they somebody writes a book real quick about that, I'm, I'm gonna check it out. Uh, because it, to me, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So again, I, I think these, these categories are kind of vague. So let's, let's kind of look at it from the perspective of what is, you know, living beyond means, that's the major, that's the major one as far as the ACFE is concerned, what, what does that typically look like? And so I'm gonna use myself as a guinea pig here. I'm gonna be an open book and I'm gonna give you all kinds of information about me to kind of show you what that would mean. So if you all were looking at me thinking I was committing fraud at the legislative auditor's office, what would, what would my pressure look like? Well. If you talk to my coworkers, or if you did a Google search, and a Google search on me would be very easy because of my last name, you, you would have no you would have no problem realizing that yeah, that's the person you're looking at. But living beyond my means, so if you did the Google search, social media search, you would see I'm a sports person. I I was a baseball guy. Uh, I'm married. My wife works at a state agency. I have two teenagers, a son, 16, a daughter, 13. They play sports, baseball, swim, 
Um, so that would be it. So now if we're looking at me in terms of living beyond my means, what would you expect to find? Well, if you, if you looked at my property, you would maybe expect to find maybe a pool, maybe a batting cage, uh, maybe some really nice cars, maybe an outdoor kitchen, those kind of things. Those kind of things maybe wouldn't, wouldn't be in line with my income. And it's kind of fun to think about because I'm spending money I don't have, but that's, that's kind of what we would be looking at. Now, in reality, you won't see any of those things. I'll tell you that right now. You won't see any of those things. So then it gets to the point where, okay, well, what's next? Well, chances are it's kids. Okay, how, how expensive is it to raise kids these days? If you, my kids go to Catholic school. Um, now the Catholic school parking lot, that's probably where you want to check out. You see the cars that those kids are driving. Um, <laughs> check out their parents. Um, but in reality, it's, it's a lot of times it's kids. Kids are expensive. My son plays baseball. At some point, he wants to go to college. He wants to play baseball in college. That could be a serious problem because chances are baseball is going to dictate where he goes to college and where are those opportunities going to be. I have no idea at this point. I don't know. If, let's, let's look in state. Let's say Tulane wants my son to go there and play baseball. Well, baseball has only, what, 11 scholarships for 32, 32 players. That scholarship, even if it, if it was there, if it was offered, it wouldn't make a dent in the $70,000 price tag for Tulane. So that, that's probably where my pressure is gonna be. One thing on top of that is people in my age category, the people who are most likely to commit fraud, not only do I have kids, I probably have ailing parents. And chances are I have two sets of ailing parents because they're getting up there in age. So it's, it takes a, little, takes a little work, but finding the pressure Finding the incentive is, is pretty, uh, it's usually very apparent. Um, opportunity as, as overseers of public funds, this is kind of where we control uh, whether or not people have, people have the ability to steal or, or the perception that they can steal and get away with it. So if we look at my opportunity at the legislative office, look, that's, that's slim. There's no chance. It's, it's very unlikely. If I'm a salaried employee, so is it possible for me to somehow get into the payroll system and manipulate that to change my payroll rate? Probably not. Uh, paid overtime, well, that's, that's an option. I think, my, I think the person who, who approves my timesheet would probably fall out of their chair if I, if I uh, click the box for paid overtime because I haven't done that since 2005. Um, but that's a possibility. I travel a lot. Our, our staff travels all throughout the state. Uh, so ex expenses, they could be doing something there. Um, so that covers asset misappropriation. Um, I don't have any incentive to uh, commit financial statement fraud, so that's not it. The other, the other category would be corruption. So maybe I can come to your agency and sit you down and shake you down for money. We're going to tear this place apart unless you give me some money. Eh, it's possible. So those might be the opportunities, but at our office, it's uh, not very likely. Okay, so the rationalization. Rationalization. Good people. Most most fraudsters in local government, state government, are first-time offenders. They're good people. They have good values, but they have a pressure. They have an opportunity, and now somehow they have to rationalize in their mind why what they're doing is not wrong. The first one, borrowing, that's always, always going to deal with cash. It's always going to deal with cash. I've never, never come across anybody who has written themselves fraudulent checks and say, ah, I was just borrowing that money, I was going to pay that back. That, that's not the case. It's those cash collections, people take money from the drawer, maybe they put a check in there to substitute for it, maybe they don't, but chances are borrowing is going to be cash. Um, underpaid, entitled, there, there's all kind of different rationalizations. For me, if I was at the legislative auditor's office and I was stealing, probably, how would I rationalize it? Well, 
maybe it's maybe it's they pile on a lot of responsibilities. I, I've got to do investigations. I've got to review investigations. I've got to deal with the fraud hotline. I've got to come do presentations. And trust me, I'm a wound up guy. And when I have to get in front of people to speak, it's stressful. I get stressed out. So I'll be relieved when this is done. But that could be my rationalization is they, they pile all this stuff on me. They don't give me any additional money. I'm going to get paid one way or the other. So that would be that that might be uh, a rationalization for myself. Any questions on the fraud model? Okay. There's another model that I've seen. Um, basically, it just adds another leg to the triangle, and the, the leg the leg is down there at the bottom right. It says capability. What is trying to say is that people, you have to have a person that's capable of committing the fraud. Um, to me, it's just kind of overkill, land yap. Uh, the capability is going to have to do with your opportunity. If there's more opportunity, if there's a lack of internal controls, if there's no segregation of duties, uh, if there's no management review and oversight, everybody's going to be capable. It's, it's as simple as that. Okay, so the fraud tree, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly. Uh, so the ACFE defines uh, three different types of occupational fraud, waste, and abuse. The first is fraudulent financial statements. The second is corruption. And the third is kind of the big one, asset misappropriation. So if we look at this tree, and there's kind of all branches all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we kind of have to look at this from the government perspective because this is this is everything. This is government, not for profits, uh, for profits. You know, if you look up into the right hand corner, you have financial statement fraud. All those timing differences, fictitious revenues, concealed life, those don't really apply to us. We don't. We have a different focus, a different set of financial statements, so we don't really deal with any of that. In, in that light, some of the things that we do deal with, some of the things that we do see are, you know, maybe an agency will kind of fudge the numbers a little bit for bond purposes, maybe to enhance projections, the revenues that they might have to show that they'll actually be able to repay bonds. Um, another example is maybe monthly financial information that's presented to a board, uh, you know, in the simplest terms, and I, I've seen this, you'll have, you say, what, what information do you provide to your board on a monthly basis during the meeting? And I'll get a piece of paper that says, checking, beginning, less, expenses, equal, ending balance. That's it. Now, sometimes, sometimes they'll list out those different expenses by, maybe by vendor and amount, but chances are, they're not going to include the fraudulent disbursements that they had for the month. So, I mean, really, that's the only other, the only other time we've seen that. Um, so now, in the middle, we have asset misappropriation, and it kind of comes down, and we've got all this different stuff. If we start out onto the right, we have inventory and other assets. Uh, you know, larceny. Basically, you're going to have theft. There's always going to be theft of fuel, tools, equipment, supplies. Um, misuse, that's a little bit more common. Misuse to me would be kind of the state statute. You know, state statutes, you've got theft and you've got unauthorized use of a movable. Theft is misappropriation with the intent to permanently deprive. Unauthorized use of, uh, of a movable is basically theft without the uh, intent to deprive permanently. So personal use of equipment, personal use of vehicles, that's the kind of stuff we would have there. Um, moving on into fraudulent disbursements, billing schemes, yes, shell company, yes, non-accomplice vendor. Non-accomplice vendor is kind of a, I had to look that one up. And basically what that is, is just using the invoices, falsifying invoices of existing vendors to uh, get payments out the door. Uh, personal purchases, that's almost always going to be credit card purchases. 
Um, if we move over further, we get payroll schemes. Um, kind of the interesting one there is ghost employees. I, I have not found that to be very common in government. Um, sometimes you'll hear about deadhead employees that it's the kind of person that's on the payroll, but nobody really sees that person. They don't know what they do. Um, so that's, I, I would probably cross out ghost employee. Falsified wages is a good one. Um, you know, increasing hours, increasing the pay rate without authority. Commission schemes, probably just go ahead and cross that off. That doesn't really apply in any shape uh, in government. When we get to expense reimbursement schemes, I always think about travel. Um, and yeah, to some degree, that, that all happens. Um, but the one I would focus on there is fictitious expenses. Um, you know, you have a, a clerk that may write herself a, a, a check, and in the memo it says computer repair. There was never any computer repair, and I think what you'll see is eventually if you look, if you go further and you look in the book, she probably, probably wrote that check to herself, but in the QuickBooks made an entry that it was to Bob's computer repair or something like that. Um, now the, the, the check tampering, I look at check tampering as those are, those are ways that we carry out our billing schemes, payroll schemes, and expense reimbursement schemes. Um, now when we move over to cash, everybody kind of wants to make this distinction between theft of cash receipts is skimming and cash larceny. And I guess the difference that, that the ACFE is trying to make is skimming is taking cash before it's recorded on the books and records of the company or the, the, the agency, um, while cash larceny is the opposite. It's just taking the money after it was recorded. Um, if, if you think about skimming, is any, anybody ever seen Roadhouse, the movie Roadhouse? Yes. So the Patrick Swayze character, he, he's at the bar trying to turn it around. The first night he watches the bartender and bartender goes and hits the cash register, it opens up, he puts the cash in his pocket. And he ends up firing them and then there's a big fight and that's the exciting part of it all. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about receipts, chances are we're talking about traffic tickets or utility collections. The problem is, skimming, if you do take cash, you've got to wipe that person's receivable off the system. So, unconcealed, no, probably not. The concealment is going to be on, on the write-off, on the write-off schemes. Um, you know, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen a clerk take cash, issue a receipt, pocket the cash, and this was, probably, this was probably 10, 12 years ago, they recorded the payment in 2025. So it never showed up on a, it never showed up on a current report, but it, it was recorded. It, it, it reversed the receivable. The, the customer didn't come complaining and say, I paid my bill, uh, what are you guys doing? So that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, lapping schemes, I, I think probably, Probably the best thing, or best thing to put there is probably check substitution. Um, people will take payments and they'll take money from other sources and substitute that in there. Uh, you know, I recently had a mayor that what she would do for her own account every month is on the sheet that they write in the payments that were received. She would write her name, her account number the amount and check. So they use that sheet, post everything to the system, but when we looked at the deposit detail, we never saw a check from her included in that detail. What we did find was we did find money orders from traffic citations. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of ways to write off those, uh, those account balances. It's just a matter of where are you going to look, um, non-cash transactions, adjustments, that's uh, pretty big. Uh, so that kind of leaves us with corruption. 
When it comes to corruption, you, at the top there's conflicts of interest, purchasing schemes. I, I went to the fraud manual for the ACFE and they didn't have any information for purchasing schemes. I, I would just take that, the conflicts of interest, those are going to be in the billing schemes and the shell companies under fraudulent disbursements. Um, that's probably, that's going to be the byproduct of those billing schemes. Uh, bribery. You know, when I think of bribery, I, I think of transactions that happen on the front end. Something, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you cash for this. A, a, a really good example of that would be uh, the Shawshank Redemption, where the warden is using the inmates for his public works projects and he's getting paid. He basically has no labor costs. And while they're out in the field, one of the one of the competing contractors comes up to him and he says, look, Warden, you're killing me. I, I, can't, I can't underbid you because you've got free labor. And he hands him this pink box with a pie that his wife made for the Warden with an envelope full of cash. Um, so the Warden sticks his greedy little fingers in the, in the cash instead of the pie. Um, and that's how that goes. So I, I see bribery on the front end. Invoice, kickbacks, those are always going to be on the back end uh, of a billing scheme with a shell company, non-accomplice vendor, so on and so forth. Um, one of these days, one of these days I'm going to take that whole tree um, and try to rearrange it uh, because the other thing is it doesn't account for benefit fraud. Uh, you know, workers' compensation, uh, unemployment, food stamps, Medicaid, it, it doesn't apply to any of that. So uh, I, think, I think from the government perspective, we could, we could do a lot with the fraud tree. Um, any questions? The next, it's over here. The next several slides, just kind of basically what we discussed. Um, but I have time, so let's, let's get to the, the, the more fun stuff. Um, kind of what I talked about earlier is how do, the, how do these fraud investigations unfold? What happens? Um, again, when I look back, I, I, I kind of saw a pattern of different things, um, you know, different steps, different outcomes, but everything pretty much remains the same. Um, so. On the left, we have the five stages of grief. On the right, we have kind of uh, the similarities with the investigations and the five stages of grief. So the first stage is denial. So denial kind of comes in, in, in two different ways. Number one, internally, you have somebody that's committing fraud, and there's somewhat of a battle going on between their moral compass and what they're doing, and they're rationalizing their behavior. Sorry. So there's a rationalization going on, and that goes back to the fraud triangle in the first leg, or the actually the third. Um, but they're rationalizing in their mind why what they're doing is not wrong. Um, later on down the line, they may make it right, they may not, um, but externally, what you have is they're denying that the, that the transactions are occurring because they're covering them up. Um, you know, if we go back to those fictitious, fictitious expenses, if, if a clerk uh, writes herself an extra check for $800 for computer repair and then goes into the accounting system and lists an actual vendor other than herself, well then she's trying to cover up, she, he, trying to cover up and deny that, that those, those transactions are actually happening. Okay, so number two. So now we've started an investigation. We've come into an agency and, you know, realistically there's going to be some negative, there's going to be some negative feelings. Um, you know, People don't want the legislative, the legislative auditors, investigators in their office. Um, you know, what are they looking at? First thing they want to know is what's the complaint? Who made the complaint? But how they act and how that all unfolds kind of will tell you a lot 
about how the rest of the investigation is going. And, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, you go into an agency and why are you here? Why didn't you call? What authority do you have to be here? Those, those people, those people are, are, when we come down here to the layer, they never get to these other stages. It's, you kind of have to force them into it. But it, it really tells you a lot about what we're getting into. Um, so is the ang does the anger manifest itself outward or does it not? And that, that, that tells us a lot. The third stage bargaining. So now we're, now we're in the investigation. We're asking questions. How can this happen? Could this happen? Uh, who's responsible for this? How does this work? Um, that's when we get lame excuses. People bargain with lame excuses. Uh, you know, I've heard on a number of occasions that storms completely knock out and wipe out utility systems. It doesn't happen. Those are backed up. Those systems work. Um, so the lame excuses are, are sort of a, a bargaining. Um, and a, and a, good, a good question to ask somebody is, who do you think could have committed this fraud? And the answer to that question will be very telling as well. Well, if you get an answer of, well, our agency is open all the time. People come in and out. We leave our cash drawers open and the vault open. So anybody could have done it. That's not, I've, that's uncommon. I didn't make that one up. Um, but what, what does that tell you about that person? That person has <laughs> no regard for the agency, no regard for the funds of the agency. Um, and basically what they're doing is trying to say, it's not me, it's everybody else. So go look at everybody else. Spend your time looking at everybody else. So that's very telling. Um, the fourth stage, so now we're real heavy into it. We're, we're, we're coming up with findings. We, we think we have enough evidence to prove X, Y, and Z. Um, internally, good people, first time offenders, they're having a problem with what they're doing. And now there's kind of a spotlight on it and it's not uncommon for them to actually go into a little bit of a depression. But in terms of the investigation, in the investigation what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to throw so much evidence at, at whoever it is that I'm going to defeat them. And they're going to be defeated and then they're going to move into acceptance. Um, and, and eventually take responsibility for what they've done. Again, if you go back to number two, the real hardcore people who don't want you there, who resist and fight every time you ask them for a document, those people are never going to go to four and five. They're never going to get there. The only way you're going to get there, and, and they'll ask for it, they'll say, you guys are wrong, I want my day in court. Well, you're going to get your day in court during a plea agreement, and that's going to be it. That's, that's the only way to get some of those folks into uh, that particular stage. Any questions? I think I got, I think I got about 20 minutes. So let's talk about, right yes, sir. Um, and it's okay if you don't have an answer, but can you tell the difference between uh, innocent and guilty anger during step two here? Like, yeah. Um, what he's asking is if, from the anger perspective, can I tell a difference between innocent and guilty? Um, innocent doesn't last very long. It kind of subsides. So, so if that person is angry uh, and they're innocent, you know, maybe they're having a bad day when I show up. Uh, maybe they were off when I show up. We'll, we'll get into an example of that. Um, they may be a little worked up initially but then we you know I always have a copy of the audit law we go over the audit law um, those people will calm down and then they'll they'll get you any records that you need the people that I don't have time for this I don't know what you guys are doing here tell me what the complaint is this has already been looked at and that goes on and on and on throughout the course 
of the investigation to the point where I'm not talking to you guys without my attorney, that kind of stuff. Those are more likely the guilty folks. So it's like submitting to the process? Yes. Yeah. I would say so. And, and I mean, we, we have the authority. That most quasi-public agencies are, uh, can, can be kind of a problem because they don't think they're subject to the audit law. They, they may not know. They may, not, uh, they may have just gotten a grant that particular year. Um, so there's, there's a good bit of ignorance to the audit law. Nobody, I, I, haven't gone, I haven't gone into any agency where somebody's actually read the audit law. Um, their CPA tells them everything they need to know and everything they need to do. So, uh, you know, but once, once you get cooperation, then, you know, that's, it, it, it could be, but more likely, yeah, that, that's probably your innocent person. Any other questions? Okay. So let's kind of take a look at one of these. And I've got a bunch of them. Um, But this is the one I really want to talk about. So this is a hospital service district. And this, is, this is actually a long time ago. This, um, so I don't need to worry about whether there's any hurt feelings. Um, complaint. We got a complaint from the CPA who was performing their audit. Um, obviously, he wasn't performing enough procedures. But the complaint was that the hospital was paying excessive amounts for insurance, for life insurance policies for employees and, and the Board of Commissioners. And life insurance policies for employees and commissioners, that doesn't really make a lot of sense on the face of it. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what we were there to look at. Met with the CPA, discussed the issue, and then we showed up unannounced at the hospital. Um, let's see. So we'll just go ahead and get in front of them. The, the findings, the first two bullets, uh, multi-million dollar findings, multi-million dollar frauds. And then everything was just kind of, I mean, honestly, it was, it was easy to pile on. Um, but again, the second bullet, the insurance agent fraudulently billed hospital and split proceeds with the administrator. That's what we were there for. Um, if, millions, if millions of dollars are leaving a rural hospital for life insurance for employees and commissioners, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And that's going to be something that's going to take a lot of time, considering the fact that if you first look at the invoices, the invoices said virtually nothing. Um, so we know we're going to have to get a lot of records from, a, from the vendor, from a lot of different places. So at that point, the strategy was, all right, that's going to take a lot of time. I'm going to have my AIC, the auditor in charge. She's going to start getting those records, making the requests. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember if we, we wrote up subpoenas for that or not. I'm, I'm assuming we did. Um, but in the interim, what are we going to do? Well, in the interim, what I like to do is I want to test the people that are in charge, the hospital administrator and the board commissioner. And I want to see what they're doing with public funds uh, other than the insurance. So probably the first, first place I'll look is the credit cards. Hospital administrator had a credit card. Board commissioner had a credit card. That was that struck me as odd. I don't I don't know why, what the purpose of that was, um, but when we started looking at it, it was kind of an O S H you know what moment um, because we found about seventy thousand dollars in personal credit card transactions. It was it was fuel. It was out of state travel that had nothing to do with business. There was a $10,000 deposit to a resort in Arkansas for a wedding reception. Um, so it was, it was kind of out there. Uh, the board commissioner's credit card had a charge at an equipment company for tractor tires. I thought that was odd. Um, so we kind of did a little inspection around the hospital. And they did have a tractor. 
Um, there, was a, there was a yard, a field behind the hospital that they owned, so they had to mow that property, and they used a tractor. So we went to the maintenance guy and said, did you guys replace the tires, the tractor? He said, his response was, yeah, the board commissioner rolled the tractor in a ditch. Hmm, okay, well tell me about that. Well, he was mowing grass on his property and he rolled, rolled in a ditch and we had to replace the tire. Well, wait a minute, what, he's, how, how does that work? Well, says the maintenance guy, generally when he wants to cut grass, he calls the maintenance department, he asks for me, he asks me to fill it up with fuel and leave the key in it. Leave the key in it? Well, so, so what does he do? Does he bring a trailer and, and put it on a trailer and take it away? No, he just starts it up and drives down the road and, and goes and, and he, so, uh, personal use of equipment, that's where that came in. Wasn't looking for it, it was just something that came up. Um, you know, again, you got, the tr you got the credit cards, you got fuel, so now I want to look at the hospital administrator. I want to know what he's paid, uh, what uh, accounts payable checks he gets, what reimbursements he gets. So what I found was he gets mileage reimbursements. Well, he's paying for the gas with a credit card. Not only does he get mileage reimbursements, free gas, he gets a vehicle allowance. So that doesn't make sense. And then when he travels, he gets a travel advance. And it turns out with the travel advances, if he went on, if he went on a trip with his wife and kids, he would just have the have the executive assistant write him a check for a thousand dollars, and he would go. So now it's coming clear that these folks have no interest in taking care of public funds, and we have a we have an equal well we have an enormous problem with the insurance. We keep working on the insurance. Uh, the, the first bullet, contractor fraudulently built hospitals, split proceeds. Again, that was one we kind of ran into. Um, you know, that particular vendor had received a lot of money and kind of what we found out was there was a contractual agreement between the vendor and the hospital. The vendor would provide the equipment and the management services, meaning the employee, an employee to run uh, a particular department, I think it was radiology. So when we went to that department, eh, we see the equipment, that's fine. Um, there's a guy there running it. When we, when we talked to the guy, he, he told us he was a hospital employee and he was on the hospital's payroll. Well, the contract, the contract said that he was the vendor's employee and the vendor was gonna pay him. So uh, and now we got something else. Long story short, hospital administrator procured the, procured the vendor with every intent of having him provide all the services necessary uh, to manage the radiology department, including providing the equipment. The equipment, the equipment was the key though. The equipment, the vendor purchased, installed it, and it was about probably a $500,000 uh, you know, cost for him. And once that, once that equipment was installed, hospital administrator said, hey, wait a minute. I'm gonna give you an employee, so you don't have any payroll costs. I'm gonna give you an employee, the hospital's gonna pay him, and you're gonna give me five to $10,000 a month for the life of the contract, which went on for five years. So, um, So a lot, of, a lot of different stuff was going on there. So the question is, with all these things, with all these little issues going on, how are we gonna handle this? We're still working on the insurance. It's, it's a complicated finding. Um, how are we gonna handle this? Normally, normally what we would do is we'd kind of wrap up our audit. Um, we'd kind of have all of our issues. We'd, we'd probably sit our target down and, and kind of go over a final interview. That's normally what we would do. Um, in this particular instance, I took a different approach. Um, basically what I said was, look, 
we, we've got credit cards, we've got travel advances, we've got mileage reimbursements, we've got payroll, we've got all these different things. I'm gonna hit them for one each week until we finish and get this insurance thing done. So basically, we, you know, every week that we were there, we said, oh, okay, well, let's, let's sat him down and talk to him about credit cards. Well, he wrote a check for $60,000 to make, to make reimbursement for that. Okay, well, that's fine, and we can go ahead and write that. Um, we've got restitution. Next week, we talk about travel advances. The following week, we talk about payroll. Um, and, and basically, it was, it was kind of a, I hate to say it, it was kind of a beatdown, just kind of an ongoing beatdown to, uh, to kind of get to the point where we finished, we wrapped up with insurance and uh, the radiology contractor, and it actually worked. I was kind of surprised. Um, let me get back to the, so, so here's, I mean, here's basically the benefits that he got from uh, the first vendor, he got about $566,000. That was actually uh, the vendor. The vendor would receive payment from the hospital, and then he'd uh, basically take money and, and uh, deposit it straight into a, a, a not-for-profit shell company. Um, 650000 that was just straight cash. That's the low-end estimate of what that particular vendor told us that he gave in cash. Um, payments to the daughter. The insurance vendor put the daughter on his payroll. She was in college at the time, so she could basically sit in his office and study, and he would pay her $1,000 a week. Um, and you can see it kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, now, from how did we handle this particular gentleman? Um, like I said, when we first started the audit and we showed up unannounced, he was not there. He wasn't there. So, you know, when that happens, a couple different things go on. When the, when the agency uh, head isn't there, somebody will immediately get him on the phone and he'll be right there. Uh, other times, somebody may hand you a phone and say, here, here's our attorney. Our attorney wants to talk to you and you kind of have to navigate that. Um, it was kind of uneventful. His assistant called him. He came in. Um, while we were sitting in his office, the, the thing that I remember that jumps out at me is he had all these monitors on his desk. And, and the first thing that came to my mind was maybe sports betting or something. Um, but it turns out he was kind of a... This guy was probably early 60s. He had three daughters. I think two were in college. Um, one was probably still in high school. And then he had parents in a neighboring state that were elderly, and one may have actually been in hospice at the time. Um, so like we kind of touched on before, he's kind of one of those people that's in between. He's got all the, he's got all the pressure of, of his kids and sending his kids to college. And on top of that, he's got parents. Um, that that can take a toll, um, but but he was he was kind of a day trader, and I think that's what he was using doing on those monitors. He was a lot of people described him as kind of a <coughs> excuse me. He was always trying to find a get rich uh, quick scheme, and what it turned out is they were he and the insurance agency the insurance agent were buying Iraqi currency and. Uh, I don't think any of those worked, but anyway. So, so when he did come in to talk to us, it was pretty uneventful. Um, basically what he says is, look, my, my assistant, she runs everything, she'll, she'll get you anything you need. And then he just kind of disappeared. We never really saw him. We had to, whenever we showed up, we had to seek him out and find him um, to the point where when we did wrap up our insurance finding, we made an unannounced visit. It was probably, I think it was the week of 4th of July, so it was early in the week, and maybe the 4th was Thursday or Friday or something like that. Showed up, um, he wasn't there. We asked his assistant, she said, well, he had a medical emergency for his dad in Texas, so he took off. So his house was on the way back to Baton Rouge, 
Uh, so we stopped by and there was a, uh, there was a pool party going on <laughs> at his house with, with the girls. So um, he, his base, basically his tactic was to kind of run and hide and, and keep away from us. Okay, so wrapping up. So looking at this from the five stages, uh, denial, you know, he, he, he wasn't present. He just kind of disappeared. Maybe he thought it would go away, maybe he wouldn't, but um, it's not that he was uncooperative and it's not that he was even trying to cover anything up because nothing, nothing was covered up. Um, but he just, you know, I, I think he rationalized in his mind, you know, he was trying to get kids in school. Um, he was living beyond his means and he was always trying to get rich quick. Uh, anger, well, no, he didn't, he didn't have anger. He, he cooperated when he was there. Um, he answered our questions, um, and he eventually answered the United States Attorney's questions. Um, but during the process, he, he did bargain with lame excuses. Uh, key man policies. Anybody ever see or hear of key man policies in government? No? Okay. No, it doesn't make any sense. And, and the excuse was, well, our medical billing director passed away several years ago and it really put us in a bind, so we got a key man policy. But they didn't get a key man policy on the new biller. They got key man policies for the hospital administrator and the commissioner, so it, it didn't really make any sense. And then they had some, the, the term life insurance, that, that's, a, that's a benefit they were trying to give to employees. Is that, I don't see that as a benefit. Um, the the self-insured health insurance policy didn't make any sense either. Um, it didn't make any sense because the employees would just go to the hospital, get treatment, and they wouldn't bill for it. So, I mean, it didn't, no sense. Um, depression, he did, when, when he did fess up, he did talk about depression. He was feeling depressed. The scary, the scary part of it was, so he was the hospital administrator, number one, but number two, he was also working on a contractual basis for the hospital as a pharmacist. So, uh, you know, I, was he self-medicating? I don't know. Did there need to be an audit of the pharmacy? Probably. Um, you know, during our interview, he mentioned he, he, he was going to go to jail and all that. Um, but he, we did get him to acceptance. So um, it, was a, it was probably one of the funnest cases I've ever, I've ever had at the legislative auditor's office. Um, I think, I, I think I'm, I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure it, it was, it wasn't two to three years. It was a lot longer than that. It was a pretty stiff penalty. Um, so it was, it, and it was in federal court too. So there's, there's a mandatory, at that time, I don't, I don't know about now, but there was mandatory sentencing guidelines. So it was, it was a pretty st stiff sentence. Yes, ma'am. Well, the, the, the question was, how long did it go on? I think that was one. Uh, at least five years. At least five years. How do we find out about it? How do we find out? The CPA. The CPA who does their annual audit. After five years? Yes. I don't, I don't know that he's, I don't know that that CPA is still doing work for our office. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's something he should have questioned. No, but it was your, your, somebody in your office who discovered it. No, no. It was the, 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 the local CPA that audited the hospital annually. And he alerted you? He did. How many times do you think you're not alerted? How do you find out about that? How many times did we're not alerted? Um, what if nobody blows the whistle? 
If nobody blew the whistle, it would have gone on a long, long time. That's a problem. Yeah, I agree. Ma'am, last question. I have a, I have a question from our online okay. community. Okay. How long is a typical investigation from the point of complaint? No, the uh, a typical typical investigation will last six to nine months. Obviously, more complicated ones will go on longer. Um, so six to nine months. Our audit reports are public, so the names of the perpetrators are included in those reports. Um, Ma'am. I, I think this. Right. I, I think this was complete audit failure for several years. I'm sorry. How long ago did this take place? Uh, I think our report was issued in January of 2013. So. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. If you if you check Google, you you might not find the that be the case. But um, anyway, I'm I'm being told I'm out of time. I appreciate y'all's attention. Um, if you have any questions, my uh, email and phone number are on the packet. Uh, feel free to call or email. Um, and again, thank you very much.